All right, let's get started. In this short session, TA session, we return to the basic concept of the Bellman equation. Uh, I emphasized in the previous TA session that uh, um, forming decision problem in terms of the Bellman equation is a basic creed of the Chicago School of Economics. So this is the reason why I'm also trying to emphasize uh, the importance of the ability uh, to form various decision problems in uh, terms of the Bellman equation. So uh, today uh, we are going to analyze a decision problem again uh, in terms of the Bellman equation. This is an information problem. We have a decision maker that is supposed to maximize its capital in two political capital in two distinct uh, districts and uh, the process the real process through which uh, the dynasty can maximize optimize its uh, capital stocks uh, is affected by random shock uh, this is shock z so uh, the dynasty needs to take into account this shock even in cases where it's not observed it's unobserved um, you can read uh, the text of the problem please uh, go over the problem we have one two three four five uh, different cases uh, i will try to show you uh, how the time uh, timing of the Bellman equation uh, affects changes the structure of the Bellman equation sometimes uh, especially uh, in case one uh, sometimes uh, the Bellman equation is written uh, at a time when uh, the basic information is unknown even though that piece of information is going to be known uh, when the decision maker makes its allocation uh, decision. Uh, so uh, the basic ingredients of the problem is uh, written in this slide. So please, uh, again, please go over the problems and then we are going to solve uh, the cases in turn. Okay, so let's go over the cases, the five cases, one by one. In case one, uh, shock Z is not known uh, at the time when we describe the Bellman equation. So it's not known, it's unknown in the time of the Bellman equation, but it's going to be known when the decision maker, the dynasty, makes its allocation decision. So... Uh, at the time of the Bellman equation, we need to calculate with an expected value why the dynasty doesn't need to rely on expected values. So, uh, in the Bellman equation, uh, the maximum is not an expected uh, expression, uh, only uh, the maximized expression is an expected value. So formally put, we have the following Bellman equation. We have an information component in the Bellman equation. Uh, this piece of information is the information we have at the time uh, of the Bellman equation regarding uh, shock Z. So, as I have just mentioned, uh, the dynasty doesn't need to rely on expected values, but we do. So, what we can write is uh, the Bellman equation which is going to maximize 
on the basis of observed shock Z, which is going to be known to the dynasty, but we, at the time of the Bellman equation, we don't know this piece of information. Oh, geez. So these are the laws of motion for the capitals. Please note that this is key A prime, this is KB prime, this is Z, so in sum, this is value function, this is a value function which is in complete line. Uh, with the value function on the left hand side and we need to finish the expression with the integral. The expected value of z for us on the basis of the piece of information uh, that we have. So once again uh, the dynasty, the decision maker, doesn't need to rely on expected values at the time of the decision, but we uh, write the Bellman equation for the decision maker at a time when the shock is not yet known, neither to us, uh, either to us or to uh, the decision maker. So this is the reason why we need to put uh, the maximum uh, into an expected value operator, which is, in this case, is an integral. So this is the Bellman equation, what we were looking for. In case two, um, at the time of the Bellman equation, uh, shock Z is uh, known. So the dynasty makes an informed decision, and this fact must be expressed through the Bellman equation too. So given the fact that shock Z is known, it is become a part of the state, and uh, we, we only need uh, an expected value uh, because of the shock next period. So we need to calculate with an expected value only because of the shock next period. So formally put, we have the following Bellman equation. Now, shock Z is known, so it's in the Bellman equation. It's known to the family, the dynasty. So here, when the decision, the allocation decision is made, we don't need an expected value. But given the fact that the shock is in the state, then it must be in the state next period. So we cannot avoid working with the expected values because shock next period enters the value function next period. Okay, so this is capital in uh, District A, next period, governed by the law of motion, the given law of motion. This is capital, next period, for District B, and 
this is the shock next period. So all in all, our value function is in complete line with the value function on the left hand side. So it's all right. But we need to calculate the expected value of shock Z next period. So this is the Bellman equation in case two. In case three, we have a new scenario. The decision maker, the dynasty makes its allocation decision without knowing shock Z that fundamentally affects the results of uh, the decision. So uh, we must use the prior shock, the value of the shock previous period. Uh, we need to rely on its information uh, content. So in contrast with case one, we uh, and the dynasty must uh, maximize an expected value. So formally put, we have the following Bellman equation. As I have just mentioned, shock previous period is the information source, is the information basis on which the dynasty can makes can make sorry can make its uh, optimum decision. So shock Z throughout the Bellman equation is only an expected value which is calculated on the basis of the shock previous period. This is capital A next period. And you know that shock Z affects the outcome of the allocation decision. So it enters as an expected value into, it enters the value function next period and it is calculated as an expected value and just double checking the result. Which is in line with the left hand side of the Bellman equation. So our Bellman equation seems to be seems to be correct. In case four, we have a new setting. There is a change in the nature of the shock. Now, shock Z uh, is IID. We know its distribution, so we know its expected value, but uh, prior shocks are completely uninformative uh, with respect to the expected value uh, of Z. However, there is a signal S uh, which uh, complicates things a bit. The real process is still affected by Z, shock Z, but uh, on the basis of S, shock Z uh, becomes uh, uh, predictable. Uh, we have a conditional density function of uh, Z with respect to S. 
So on the basis of S, the observed signal, we can know the distribution uh, of Z. So expectations must be built on this conditional the density function. What Bellman equation do we have now? There is a trick in this exercise. Even though we can infer the expected value of Z on the basis of S, the observed signal, S, the signal, is not yet observed. So we work with the distribution of S, yielding an expected value of S that determines an expected value for Z through the conditional density function. Note that there is no information in the Bellman equation, neither Z nor S is observed when the Bellman equation uh, is written, and prior shocks are uninformative. So formally put, we have the following uh, Bellman equation. Again, there is no information in the Bellman equation, and uh, shock Z is unobserved, and the signal is also unobserved, while the decision maker is able to observe S before making its decision, its allocation decision, or allocative decision. So in the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, we only need to give account of the two capital stocks next period. So, oh, geez. So this is capital stock A next period. This is capital stock B next period. So, in sum, this is Ka prime, Kb prime, which is in complete line with the left-hand side of the Bellman equation. Now, we need to pay attention to the distribution, the distributions. Z is predictable on the basis of S, but S is unobserved, so we can only calculate with its uh, expected value. So this case is very similar to case one. Uh, we have no information when uh, we write the Bellman equation, so everything is written in terms of uh, expected values. And finally, let's have a look at case 5. Note that in case 4, in the previous case, we had no information uh, beyond uh, the distributions. So why the dynasty can actually observe the signal S before making the decision? On this basis, the dynasty maximizes an expected value. The information is given by S and it enters the Bellman equation which, in this case, is uh, given by this expression. So, signal S enters the Bellman equation, and uh, the dynasty maximizes an expected expression with respect in which uh, expectation is given by, given by with respect to the signal S through the conditional density function of the shock. Okay, so 
we integrate over the range, just like in the previous cases, we integrate all over the range of the shock. And uh, we need the expected value of the signal next period because signal S is in the information set, it is in the Bellman equation, it is in the state on the left hand side. So this is capital in A, next period, this is capital in B, next period, and note S prime, the signal, next period, enters the value function. So in sum, we have this value function in the right hand side of the Bellman equation, which is in complete line with the left hand side of our Bellman equation. This is the, this completes the expectation of um, the signal next period, but we need to calculate shock Z, the expected value of shock Z with respect to the observed signal. So this is the Bellman equation in case 5.